Well, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here, uh, being in the, the West River. Uh, before uh, uh, moving on to uh, Marquette University in 1986, uh, for three years I was the first archivist at Oglala Lakota College on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And I, I uh, lived in Rapid City, and so I'm used to long, long distance commutes, used to uh, commute across Badlands National Park every day. <clears throat> So this morning I'm going to be uh, talking about um, Native people's devotions to St. Kateri Tekakwitha, which was something I never really started to do um, just on my own, but it began one day with a uh, surprise telephone call from Sister Genevieve Cooney, who's uh, an Oglala Lakota, and she said to me, Mark, you have to go out and interview people about Blessed Kateri. And I felt kind of fearful to go do this, and uh, I said, well, sister, I'll do this if somebody gives me the money to do this, because it was not going to be a, an inexpensive thing to travel around the United States and interview people. And I, so I said, well, I'll do it if somebody gives me the money. Well, the first uh, group that I asked was a foundation, and they gave me every penny that I asked for, which I just couldn't believe. And so then I, I had to get over my fear of interviewing people and start doing it. And very soon I discovered, hey, this is easy. I can do this. And that's, that's how I got started. And so for years, we had all this material that sitting and waiting. And uh, there were several interviews that we sent on to the vice postulator uh, for the canonization effort. Uh, because there were several, you know, uh, interviews where people uh, reported uh, through their, through they had uh, prayers to Blessed Cattery and they, uh, uh, for the healing for someone, uh, a loved one in their family, and we sent that on to the, uh, the vice postulator. Uh, so, you know, those interviews were used early on, and a few went into one book that I was involved with uh, that was published in 2003 uh, called um, The Crossing of Two Roads. Uh, being Native and Catholic in the United States, which was published by Orvis Books, uh, uh, a compilation of uh, articles about uh, Native Catholics and their, uh, that it, where they're expressing uh, what it means to them to be both Native and Catholic. But uh, this, is, this is certainly a unique effort, so uh, without any further um, discussion on my part, I will uh, begin here. Let's see. Throughout this past century, and especially since your 1980 beatification, thousands of Native North Americans have overcome personal challenges and followed the path of St. Kateri Tekakwitho. Yes, you and me, we can do this. With Gatali's help, we can overcome our personal struggles and love Jesus and use the many gifts the Creator gives, gives us to help each other. By baptism, we're all called to heaven, and someday a few of us will be canonized or recognized formally. Canonized saints are those selected by the church as models for us all. These are holy people who lived virtuous and well-documented lives confirmed by martyrdom or God's miracles while helping us through prayer. Easter eggs are symbols of the tomb from which Christ arose and the hope that we too will experience eternal life. Shown here are ones by Native artists and pictures of ten Native Catholics who were in good standing when they passed and who, we believe, have joined Jesus in heaven. From the 17th and 18th centuries is Saint Gatali Tekakwitha, an Algonquin Mohawk, holy woman from New York and Quebec, Joseph Shihongawat, a Huron martyr from Ontario, and several Apalachee Indian martyrs from Florida. From the 19th century is Geronimo, an Apache leader from Arizona, an American sister, mother, Mary Catherine Sa Sacred White Buffalo, a hunk papa, religious holy woman from North Dakota. And from the mid-19th to the 20th centuries is Nicholas Black Elk, 
an Oglala holy man and catechist from South Dakota, Father Francis Kraft, a Mohawk pastor and chaplain from North and South Dakota in Pennsylvania. He was the first uh, diocesan priest ordained uh, for Dakota Territory by uh, Bishop Marty. And sister, sister of St. Francis, Mary Olivia Taylor, a Choctaw Chickasaw educator and religious from Oklahoma. And from the mid to late uh, 20th century is Louis Sam, or Coeur d'Alene, lay church leader from Idaho, and Rose Prince, a carrier holy woman from British Columbia. And today, the 21st century, this Easter egg represents you and me, and in the hope we will be joining them. St. Gatali grew up facing many challenges and hardships. She was born in present-day upstate New York within a Mohawk community to a, to a traditional Mohawk father and a Christian Algonquin mother. And at age four, a smallpox bacterial infection raged through and devastated her and her community. It killed many people, including her parents and her brother, and it left her face scarred and eyesight damaged. Relatives in her Mohawk turtle clan then raised Gothali in the Mohawk Valley near present-day Albany. In so doing, she learned about the Creator and the turtle's foundational role in supporting all of what the Creator has made Gatali learned about the Creator's great law of peace, which bound her Mohawk people in a covenant with their nearby relatives, the Cayuga, the Oneida, the Onondaga, and Seneca nations. And together, they became known as the Iroquois. In their traditional dwelling, the Longhouse, symbolized their way of life. And because the Mohawk people lived farthest to the east, they became known as the keepers of the eastern door in a metaphorical longhouse aligned with the pathway of the sun stretching all over over all of the united iroquois peoples from east to west gatali learned about the three sisters of corn beans and squash throughout upstate new york all of the iroquois Nations cultivated Mother Earth with care and grew these crops for food which continues today. At age 18, visiting Jesuits instructed Gatali in her mother's Christian faith. And after more study, they baptized her the next spring on Easter in 1676. They gave her the name Catherine after St. Catherine of Siena, because like her namesake, she too was a very mystical and prayerful person. The following year, like other Mohawk Christians of the time, Gatali moved north into Quebec, Canada, near Montreal, where their Jesuit teachers lived. And there, she became known for her sanctity and love of Jesus. Her health failed, and she died at age 24 in 1680. And upon her death, she miraculously lost her facial scars. Fellow Mohawk Christians honored Gatali's memory and cared for her remains. And in so doing, they founded the St. Francis Xavier Church and Kanawaki by Montreal on the St. Lawrence River in 1719. The town's original bark houses gave way to brick ones, and because of the river's many rapids, its men became expert canoeists, who ventured west as voyageurs in the fur trade, long before Lewis and Clark. For generations without clergy, some men intermarried among tribes in present-day Montana, Alberta, and elsewhere. 
As lay missionaries, they spread their faith in Jesus as their savior, and their Western descendants did likewise. However, at this time, Gothalie's story was not passed on because learning about Jesus must come first. Meanwhile, Jesuits began to spread Gothalie's story. In Mexico, where evangelization had begun earlier, Jesuit educated native women religious began to honor and pray to her. But in 1773, trouble stalled her cause in Europe and North America. Under pressure from the colonizing European powers, Rome dismantled or suppressed the Jesuits worldwide. And two wars followed between British controlled Canada and the emerging United States. Thousands of Mohawks in Iroquois people died supporting both sides and the great law of peace was shaken. In 1814, Rome permitted the Jesuits to reorganize. And beginning in 1839, the pioneering Jesuit father, Pierre Jean de Smet, led the founding of Jesuit communities and schools in the Midwest and Western United States. By the 1880s, Jesuits were again promoting Gothalie's story, and they promoted petitions from North American Native Catholics and Bishop's Councils to urge the Holy Father to allow Gothalie's canonization cause to begin. One such Native petition is this translated excerpt from the Flathead people, a tribe in Montana with considerable Mohawk intermarriage and a long history of seeking Jesuit missionaries. It reads in part, this virgin, we believe, was given to us from God as a great favor, for she is our little sister. But now we hope that thou, our Father, who art the vicar of Jesus Christ, wilt grant us a favor likewise. We beg thee with the whole of our hearts to speak and say, you Indians, my children, take Catherine as an object of your veneration in the church because she was holy and in heaven. Meanwhile, in the future North and South Dakota, Father Kraft, a wounded survivor of the 1890 Wounded Knee Massacre collaborated with several Lakota Catholic women to organize the American Sisters as a community of religious women. They followed Gathalie's vision to form a Native women's religious community in conjunction with the Lakota tradition of sacred white buffalo woman who gifted them the sacred pipe as a mediating instrument for praying to God. This was reflected in the professed name of Josephine Crowfeather, the community's first superior, who became Mother Mary Catherine, Sacred White Buffalo. The community grew to at least 12 members based on the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in North Dakota and there they ministered to the three affiliated tribes of Grovant, Adadza, and Mandan, but by providing home health care and Christian religious instructions. However, skeptical government and church officials doubted their abilities and opposed their ministry, which led to their community's decline. Mother Catherine died in 1893, and the Spanish-American War ensued five years later. Only four sisters remained, who, with their chaplain, Father Kraft, enlisted in the United States Armed Forces. The sisters became the first American Indian women to serve officially, and in so doing, they successfully administered a military hospital in Havana. After the war, all returned to the United States 
except Mother Mary Anthony wrote Cloud Robe on the far left. She died in Cuba and remains buried there today. After 1900, new picture technologies became available for promoting ideas, and Catholic authors, missionaries, and other friends of Gatali added them to the promotion of her cause. Printed illustrations shown with illustrated slides and posters became common, as shown by these Choctaw girls at Holy Rosary Mission in Tucker, Mississippi. In 1931, the Bishop of Albany formally opened Gottlieb's canonization cause. More documentation was compiled, authenticated, and studied, and more petitions were gathered, which would total over 600, with nearly 100,000 signatures, all of which generated more awareness of her cause. And as the momentum grew, students at Catholic schools began to present plays about her life, and among them were plays at St. Anthony's Mission in Zuni Pueblo, New Mexico, and Holy Rosary Mission on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Native women promoted Gautali's cause through church clubs or sodalities. These Coeur d'Alene women gathered for prayer at Sacred Heart Mission on the Coeur d'Alene Indian Reservation in Desmet, Idaho in 1940. In January 1943, during World War II, Pope Pius XII declared Gautali a venerable servant of God, the first official step in the canonization process. And meanwhile, some native soldiers and soldiers-to-be sought and found her guidance and protection. Among them were, in the upper left, Henry George, a Mohawk in the U.S. Army in India, Persian Gulf, and Europe, and Samuel So in the lower left, a Navajo code talker in the U.S. Marines in the Pacific and Japan. At Iwo Jima, Private So was scared to death, but a beautiful lady in a buckskin dress, he later identified as Gatali, came to him in a vision and promised him protection if he would wear a necklace she showed him. The, ne the next day, that necklace arrived in the mail in a plain envelope addressed to him, which was very unusual since he never expected and rarely received any mail because his friends and relatives back home were not letter writers. He quickly put on the necklace and his fear left him. Then he went back to the site of the vision in hopes that she would return, but she did not. After the fur trade's decline in the 19th century, the Mohawk men of Kanawaki discovered new jobs in ironwork. They began by working in local structural steel bridge projects and then moved on to high-rise building projects in New York, New York City and elsewhere. In 1954, some workers returned home to Kanawaki to remember and honor Gatali with the gift of a miniature bridge at the dedication of her statue at the St. Francis Xavier Church. Among the Mohawk people, much of the momentum for Gatali's cause comes from the ladies, as shown in this 1990 picture, at a pilgrimage to her birthplace, now the shrine of Our Lady of Martyrs near Orysville, New York. Similarly, Mohawk ladies have contributed to the momentum of her cause within the Tekakwitha Conference. Sister Cataly Mitchell, also a Turtle Clan member like her namesake, sings praises to Gatali in 1985 at Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York. Mohawk ladies from the Aquasasne Mohawk Nation in New York and Quebec 
participate in the grand entry in 1989 in Fargo, North Dakota, and reenactor Julie Degajak Daniels performs her monologue about Gottlieb's life in 1993 in Seattle. How did the Tekak Bitha Conference begin? Early in 1939, Benedictine Father Sylvester Eisenman, a lifetime missionary among the Yankton Dakota Sioux at Marty, South Dakota, met in Fargo, North Dakota, with Bishop Aloysius Minch, a former cemetery educator from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. They discussed how best to provide mutual support and problem-solving tools for priests and men religious ministering to Native Catholics. And they agreed to launch a gathering that summer in Fargo. 27 non-Native clergy and three Native laymen attended from three states. And they agreed to meet annually to discuss pastoral concerns. And the following year, they gave the conference its name, the Tekakwitha Conference. To host its meetings, they began to rotate the site among their Catholic missions and schools in North and South Dakota, and later Montana, Minnesota, and Manitoba as well. Although named Gatalis in Gatalis honor, they never invited women. However, they invited native laymen as observers and guest speakers, and they invited native clergy and men religious as members. In 1964, the attendees posed for this picture while meeting at St. Joseph's School in Chamberlain, South Dakota, which included Jesuit Father John Brown of the Blackfeet Nation in the third row on the far left. In 1977, under the spirit of Vatican II, the conference we organized with Native Catholic leaders who soon invited to membership all persons dedicated to Native Catholic ministry everywhere. Meanwhile, Native Catholic women began to promote Gatali's cause elsewhere. Here, elders, Juana and Joe Pecos, lead a 1989 procession to enshrine Blessed Gatali in San Diego Mission in Jemez Pueblo, New Mexico, which was the first such enshrinement in a church among the Southwest Pueblo tribes. By the 1990s, Gatali's native devotees were everywhere across North America, from Eskimos in Alaska, to Pimas in Mexico, to Aquasasne Mohawks in Quebec and New York, to Cherokees in North Carolina. During the late 1970s, native Catholic clergy, religious, and laity had thoughtful discussions about inculturation, which led to various forms of inculturated mass and Catholic ceremonies in meetings at the national, regional, and local levels. As more Native Catholics joined, they brought their Native cultures with them, and from their hearts, they shared their Native languages, symbols, and practices. A Nez Pierce woman from Idaho signs the Lord's, Lord's Prayer in Plains Indian Sign Language in 1984 in Phoenix. And the Pima, and Pima ladies honored Gatali with their basket dance in mass in 1990 in Tucson. A Kateri Circle Princess Powwow Princess wears a beaded crown with a cross in 2000 in Lincoln, Nebraska, and a Crow Nation pipe carrier prays with this pipe in mass in 1991 in Norman, Oklahoma. And Laguna Pueblo eagle dancers from New Mexico honor Gatali in mass in 1992 in Orono, Maine. And this 
and the shrine honors her before a Lakota Sioux star quilt in 2003 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The conference also runs under Native leadership, which includes bishops as well as religious, clergy, and laity. And youth are involved as well. After further review, Pope John Paul II declared Gatali Blessed in 1980, the second of three steps towards canonization, which was followed by his visit to Tucson in 1987. Since Gatali's beatification, the Canadian vice postulator has given first class relics from Gatali to several native Catholic leaders who in turn began to involve them in processions and mass at the conference by 1990. The center close-ups show the reliquary and the tiny relic in the small case with the red backing. In following the pathway of the sun across North America from the Mohawk people of the Eastern Door to where the sun sets in the far west, stands this sculpture next to St. Joachim's Mission on the Lummi Nation on Puget Sound's western shore within Washington State. It depicts the origins of their Christian faith as paddlers in a dugout canoe bring the first missionary to tell the people about Jesus. Before 2006, Lummi Catholics and Sister Gatali Mitchell began planting the Tekakwitha Conference for that summer, which was to be based in Seattle. Meanwhile, in February and March of that year, six-year-old Jacob Finkbonner, a Lummi Nation boy, was fighting an aggressive strep A bacterial infection on his face. Family and friends prayed to St. Gatali to save his life. And during the conference planning, Sister Kateri visited him at Seattle's Children's Hospital, and she and his parents prayed briefly with Gatali's first class relic. Minutes later, in surgery, hospital staff removed Jake's bandages and discovered that his disease was gone. But like St. Gatali, after her disease, Jake's scars remained. That summer at the conference, uh, that summer the conference visited the Lummi Nation, and at that time, Seattle Archbishop Alexander Brunet announced the Vatican's investigation of Jake's instantaneous cure, with Jake and his family and his pastor at his side. Before 2012, the Mohawk Nation had already planned to host the Tekakwitha Conference for that summer. Then in December 2011, the Vatican announced that it authenticated Jake's cure as a miracle due to Gatali's intercession with God, and that Pope Benedict XVI would declare Gatali a saint in heaven next October. Consequently, that year's conference had the atmosphere of a religious pep rally. It concluded with Jake's transferring St. Gatali's reliquary to a representative of the next year's host committee while Sister Gatali looked on. Gatali's canonization ceremony was held in St. Peter's Plaza in Vatican City on Sunday, October 21st, it was a joint ceremony in mass involving a total of seven canonizations amid 80,000 pilgrims from Asia, Europe, and North America, and at least 2,000 pilgrims were Native North Americans, many of whom displayed distinctive Native symbols such as beadwork, buckskin, and feathers, as well as purple and white Iroquois flag depicting the historic unity between the Mohawk, the Cayuga, the Oneida, 
the Onondaga, and the Seneca nations. One pilgrim was George Looks Twice from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, a grandson of Black Elk. Mr. Looks Twice hopes that someday the church will canonize his grandfather as well. Black Elk taught traditional and Christian ways and values and baptized over 400 Indians from several North American tribes. On the left, after 1910, Black Elk was teaching his mother, Lucy, to pray the rosary. And on the right, in 1937, he is dressed in his regalia for a Black Hills tourist pageant near Mount Rushmore. For more information about um, Native people's devotion to Blessed Gadalee, or Saint Gadalee, um, I uh, wish to su suggest uh, the book that uh, I was involved with, uh, Native Footsteps Along the Path of Saint Gadalee de Caquito, uh, which uh, involves, uh, includes information that's been compiled for over the past 25 years uh, from, the, from uh, going back to the 19th century down to the present. So it, uh, uh, I think it's an extraordinary research and I'm uh, pleased to have been involved with it. Uh, it involved about 35 uh, people from uh, everyday people like yourselves, scholars, uh, most of whom were, were native people themselves. Uh, pictures for my uh, PowerPoint this morning comes uh, primarily from Marquette University in our collections, but also uh, from the uh, Archdiocese of Milwaukee Archives, the Minnesota Historical Society, uh, the, the U.S. National Archives, and the Native News Network.